Hello and welcome to our channel, Marstream, your public performance broadcast platform. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists in Marstream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website at themarsh.org for all upcoming live performances. Now enjoy the show. Hello, hello. Welcome to Stephanie's Marsh Stream with my special guest, Sarika Dagar. I'm Stephanie Wiseman, Artistic Director and Founder of The Marsh and Marsh Stream. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now let's welcome Sarika, a most talented storyteller, filmmaker, media producer, and hummingbird whisperer. Hello. So nice to see you. And I just want to say my brother is here, joined from India. So hi, Tapeshwar. <laughs> and there's a brother. Oh, and who else? Is there someone else you wanted to say? Oh, yeah. There's Gina. There's Kelly Daly. Hello, hello, Jeremy. They're all here. So fabulous. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you back <laughs> at the marsh. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Kai. You used to be at the marsh all the time. <laughs> true, true, true. I worked there as the marketing director and met so many phenomenal creatives. It's just a place filled with arts and creativity and people like yourself. <laughs> like me and like you. Too creative. <laughs> so, sorry, Kai. Yes. How did you get here and get to be so creative here? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a long journey from a tiny village in India. It's called Ujwa. And I'm sure my brother is cheering because he's right there right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, being a woman and being a creative is never an easy task, especially if you are born in a country where women are set to just, you know, you're a certain age, you have to get married. That's it. And and that too, I decided to not be a doctor or an engineer. I decided to be a creative. So yeah, I got picked up by Disney at a very early age. Thank goodness for that. How early? And how early? I, well, I was uh, almost 17. It was 1999. And yeah, I'm in my late 30s now. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks to that, I was able to save some money and participate in... Um, art school here and moved to San Francisco. Um, working at Disney really gave me a great understanding of what storytelling is and lots and lots of people from different parts of the world were around me. So that's a very young age to kind of get introduced to that kind of stuff. And uh, moving to San Francisco completely, I have no idea why I moved here. I had no idea why I picked up the art school here, but I did. And that just changed me forever because San Francisco is such a colorful city. There's, it's, it's, it's a country in itself in America. I, I, that's what I think. And I met, um, being in art school, there was so much I had to go through, so much I had to learn, so much I had to grow. And from there on, I did lots and lots of ad, ad world where I thought that I was going to change the world by just making ads for some car product, which is not how it works. And also in ad industry, I learned that there is a huge gender discrimination that takes place where even till this date, you will see that the creative directors are still the men of our, of the, of our communities and women, it's harder for them to get up higher. And um, my mom getting hit by Alzheimer's, these two kind of factors brought me into like um, a, a crossroads of my life where I realized that I want to tell meaningful stories and I don't just want to be in the backseat anymore, um, waiting for that big position to open up. I don't know if, it, if it'll ever open up. I'm minority, I'm a woman, I am, I've got color in my skin. So moving images is what I started doing. I went to City College, took a very quick class with Caroline Blair, um, phenomenal woman who, who gave me so much strength. And from there on, I started telling stories that were meaningful causes and, and uh, moving images. Yeah, I think that's kind of just pivoted my path completely and gave me a very, very huge medium to, 
to share the stories I wanted to sh share. And here I am sitting in front of you talking about it. So I think, I think it's phenomenal that I was able to do that. It sounds it. So what did you <laughs> learn at Disney about storytelling? Oh, Disney. I mean, you know, we all grew up with these cartoons and this Mickey Mouse. And for me, um, cartoons were such a phenomenal thing because like I would watch them and I would it would transfer me into this world of very bright colors and animated objects and people and human beings are talking in very like animated sounds. I love that very much. So, and suddenly you have that in front of you outside your doorstep because I was living in apartments that Disney was offering. So I was immersed in it at a, in my teenage years. Like suddenly I left a village and boom, here I am in, I, I don't think I would ever really care about Florida if I wasn't living at Disney. <laughs> but, but for me, it was just so amazing because I would wake up in the morning, I would go to a park, Animal Kingdom, I would put up my costume, which was basically a very magenta blouse and patterned skirt to look like an Indian princess living in the jungle of Maharajas. Just tell that story. Uh, I'm sure there are other kids who just laughed at it. For me, it was it was something I had to really tell. And the guests thought that I was raised in that Maharaja jungle track in the animal kingdom <laughs> because I was playing the part so so honestly. And for me, it was a, a moment of expression that I was waiting for so long. And um, even though I think 17 year old doesn't seem that long, but for me, it was a pent up of all of these years of being able to tell my story. And um, so, yeah, just, just being part of that story in the jungles, uh, in animal kingdom that they have created a jungle. So being part of that, and then they allowed us to take these little classes that we could outside of our work time in, um, in Epcot Center that were related to um, animation and drawing and it storyboarding. So that just is just too much creativity just coming at me. So, yeah. And then obviously coming to San Francisco was a no brainer. I guess that's why I kind of picked California. So before we get to that part of your life, let's talk about where you come from a little bit. And I think to talk a little bit about your father, who <laughs> yes. is a storyteller, I think, as <laughs> well, but for a large, important portion of India, right? So you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I would love to, and I'm sure my dad will enjoy it. He is a, a figure. He is an important human being of our community. You know, he, he creates these movements, these situations that, again, for me, I say that I like to talk about causes that matter. And he's been doing that all his life. And one of the things that I was uh, actually saying that to you as well, and I say that to everyone, is that I work so hard for my pieces. Like I would like put them up. I would work so hard in getting the story ideas and everything. And then I'll put them on YouTube and I'll get like 80 views. My dad goes in front of a news camera says what he has to say, he says it so well, and boom, they put it up. And within an hour, we've got hundreds and millions of views. This is a photo of him just recently, just talking about the farmers protest that is happening in India at the moment. And one of the things that he has been behind very diligently, and he's a farmer himself, let me also say that I am daughter of a farmer, is that in 1990s, he was, the national leader of the entire farmers union all over the in, all over india so he knows this content very very well and at this point the big issue that has been going on with the farmers is that they want to separate themselves from the government they want to have more autonomy and they want to make sure that there are more private investors but these new laws they're trying to go against is they're thinking that the government is not giving them the right kind of laws. My dad is actually saying, give these laws a little chance. There is, there is truth in them. And he says that if within two years, if you don't see any, anything happening, then you can go and fight. Don't just start fighting because 
boom, somebody has given you a law. He believes that there is positive interest that is um, positive interest towards farmers, um, uh, farmers' rights. And one of the things he's also talking about is that there is a huge political interest that has now gotten into farmers' protests. People that are more interested in like upping their own interest in politics have kind of joined forces with this protest. So it has kind of gone wayward. So he's trying to protect their rights by talking about it. And um, there is a clip I have shared about even in the past, he has talked about how government has uh, tried to take land away from farmers by not changing laws that were hundreds of years old. And he has, he has always kind of supported that. So today he's kind of also saying that, uh, that if he's saying, asking farmers to say yes to what the government is talking about, it's not because he's coming from a very selfish motive. He's, come, he's analyzing it in a very, very knowledgeable, from a very knowledgeable place, a person who has done this for since, I think 30, 40 years, completely working in the interests of farmers. So, so there, is a, there is a huge uh, point he's making and that's why his videos have been going viral. And uh, I, I'm not sure if you wanna show the-, yes, the yes. Why don't the, you set up this clip? So yeah, so this clip that I kind of sh shared with you is part of Lal Dora. Lal Dora basically means a red line that has been created around uh, a land by the government to be used by the government when they want it. It's kind of like a trick of land pulling. And my father has been diligently talking about stopping this law and this law has never not changed since the British had left India. So this was a big movement that he became part of. He also did hunger strike. And uh, just recently he has also tried to pivot this law by saying, okay, you can take our land, but give us the right amount of money that we deserve for it. At least we won't die poor, <laughs> you know, because farmers are always exploited. So this is something I did uh, in like uh, 2016. And there has been a lot of changes around that law. So that's a little clip and you will see various leaders from different parts of um, also, one of the things I do want to mention is that Lal Dora is a law that is only applicable to Delhi farmers. That's another messed up part of that law because it was created by British people and they left. Government never changed it because it benefits them and it's only applicable to Delhi uh, farmers. So it's kind of a corrupt situation there. So you will see various leaders from different parts of Delhi that I interviewed thanks to my dad and his efforts in allowing me to do that. So it's called Aldora. के लिए देवी शहर की डेवलपमेंट के लिए हर साल सरकार 10 10 साल में एक मास्टर प्लान तैयार करती है तो किसी भी गांव के बारे में ये नहीं लिखा कि इस मास्टर प्लान में गांव का डेवलपमेंट है इन्होंने ये देखो आप इसके ऊपर कब्जा कर लिया और ये सत्रह बिगे सात आज तक नहीं बना हिंदुस्तान में हम जो अपना हक मांग रहे हैं भीख नहीं मांग रहे it's all they are all talking in different dialects it was a bit of a project for me to transcribe too so <laughs> I'm sure my brother is like, that was not the right translation right there. <laughs> well, you don't have to fix it. <laughs> right. So you came to San Francisco, you went, came to art school and, and you studied media? 
what did you study? Oh yeah, I studied advertising design focused in art direction and cinema as my elective. And that's why after many years when I pivoted into moving images, I did workshops in cinema because I was like, ah, why did I not actually pursue that back then? You know, we all grow up later sometimes at some point. <laughs> We all evolve, we sculpt ourselves yeah. <laughs> we hope to be eventually, right? I know, I know. I have to say though, City College workshop, I recommend everyone to go and take art art education there. It's so cheap and, and the professors there are so phenomenal, hardworking and very talented. And you don't come out of it with student loan. <laughs> A perfect scenario, perfect. I know, right? <laughs> So you went to the ad companies, then yeah. did you come to the marsh from the ad companies or you had a brief between that and a brief respite, right? Is that when you came to the marsh? Marsh, I came after, came to marsh right after I had started working, doing all of this stuff that I'm talking about in terms of um, um, Alzheimer's, projects that I was doing. Uh, I was doing uh, lots and lots of social justice uh, uh, video pieces. I was also participating quite heavily with climate, um, climate uh, uh, justice uh, uh, movement. And also like there was huge, huge, huge uh, influence that was uh, happening in my work from um, the election that had just happened and there was a big, uh, you know, women's march uh, movement that had started. So I was doing a lot of that work, and then I actually started doing um, Monday Night March, little recordings that people were hiring me to do for Monday Night March, which actually blew my mind away because I entered into this little theater, and people are presenting their shows. And they were all about social justice. They were all about women's rights. There was there was so much essence of um, not just storytelling, but about what was happening in our communities. And I was just hired by one lady. And then from there on, I became some kind of a pseudo videographer for Monday Night Marsh. I didn't even meet you for like a good year and a half. And the strangest part of the whole thing is that the marketing director, Maggie, who was before me at the Marsh, was leaving and she had hired me to videotape her piece for Monday Night Marsh. And I had just seen the, the posting for Marsh's marketing director just like a day or two ago. I had completely missed the deadline and I was like, oh man, gosh, I would have done such a good job. I yeah. And then this girl emails me saying, can you record me? And I see her title saying marketing director and my light bulb went on and I was just like, maybe she's the one who's leaving. <laughs> maybe I should ask her. Maybe she'll put in a good word for me. Maybe. I don't know. And I did ask her and I was like, not, it was like a, it was not a very great ask. I did fumble a lot, but Maggie is a really phenomenal human being. I call her magical Maggie for a reason. And um, then everything was history because she spoke to you and and along come you with your dog Trinity for the interview. And I was like, all of these years I've been capturing videos and this is the person who runs this place. Wow, I love her. <laughs> I was in love with Trinity. I was in love with you. And it was one of the greatest interviews ever. We were talking about dogs and I was showing you pictures of India. <laughs> Yeah, Marsh happened in a very, very interesting and in a in a in a film. You know the twist that happens in films in that kind of way for me. The way I entered into Marsh was the right timing. I was doing all of these amazing storytelling already, and then Marsh Monday Night Marsh happens, and then very organically I was moved into the marketing director position, which was amazing. I mean, how many amazing creatives I met and. And all the pieces that you're going to be playing today, there are a lot of them are Marsh performers. Exactly. And yeah. you know, it was great because, you know, at the Marsh, we 
we work with the resources we have. And it was a time when we weren't able to do much video yet, but then you came through and we began yeah. to be able to actually get ready for Marsh stream in a way, which who knew, right? But we, you know, we focused a lot more during your tenure on video than we have had ever done before. And it's oh. a wonderful opening. The amount of equipment that you are, you, Marsh and you, all of you were sitting on, there was a closet full of it. And I, I don't know if, I, I don't know if you remember that. I was just like a kid in a candy store. Wow. 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 <laughs> they have this camera. They have this, they have a, they have a drone that there was like a hand, 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 hand handle, destab, hand handle stabilizer you had. And I was just like, this is, this is phenomenal. We got to do something about it. And um, I think we did our first, um, uh, white couch interview with the, um, ah, I forget the name of the person in San Jose. There is a Kelly, the two minds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the director, Kelly. Yeah, I can't remember the name of his organization. Uh, yes. Yeah. So that, that was the first one and it was, we, I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't realize how boomy the room was. And, and you, you came in so well-dressed, you were just ready for your take. And I was, it was great. It was, everybody was just, just ready to perform and do the part. And I think video was the right thing for the Marsh. I agree. Yeah. And, and all that equipment. <laughs> on just a little bit farther into your job after the marsh because i think you can talk a lot about inclusion and stuff like that if you yes want. yes yes yeah so i i mean after the marsh i uh, started working at lighthouse for the blind a very interesting job pivot for me because i never really looked at creating an accessible art situation I never really thought that that way. I always thought people are going to see and hear from these senses, but um, creating accessible art just changed my way of how I will always now create art. And because it brings in a very important aspect with the word that you just said, inclusivity. And I, from this stream, I do wanna say this to all the creatives out there, that if they are not making accessible art, that then we are not doing it right. We have to have to have to make art accessible because the future is accessible. And one of the greatest things I've learned for video, audio description. For, um, for images, add all text. If you're posting something on Instagram or Twitter, people are using text readers that are, people who are blind or who have low vision are using text readers to access art. And for them, an, a description of an image is how they are accessing art. And why would I not want them to experience what I have captured? You know, and uh, I would want, I am a girl from a tiny village. If I had experienced that lack of inclusivity for me, I want everyone to experience it. And so, so working at Lighthouse for the Blind has really like my friend, Gina, who's, um, in the audience at the moment. Uh, she is an ONM instru instructor and she actually teaches orientation and mobility to people in, um, at, at Lighthouse. And I've learned so much from her as well. It's like, um, it's like um, a spectrum of color and you, real, you, you have to understand that a person who has, who, is, who has low vision is actually looking at things in a contrast. So it changes the way we look at color and font and type. If you remember during our interview, I never really would have thought of it, but you told me, Sarika, can you read your ad for me? It's written in a very small font size. It's basically that's completely in the realm of a person with low vision. And I now don't even use 12 point size anymore. I use 16 as a designer, I have, pivoted too, because I do design. Video is just one of the ways I, um, I, 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 I uh, tell my stories. I also use design as a language too. So yeah, so I think future is accessible, so should be the art. 
And all the creatives, all of us should out there should look into and learn how to make art accessible by using techniques of audio description, of alt text, contrast, color contrast. And um, as simple as something like uh, a little snippet for YouTube, you, there's something called you describe where you can just literally describe your art too. So, so that has uh, changed my way of creation and brought in a lot of amazing audience in my life. So very grateful for that. Well, let's get to <laughs> what you are doing now, which is a quarantine art project. <laughs> yeah, quarantine art project. So tell us what brought you to this quarantine project. Well, the quarantine brought me to it, isn't it? it, it <laughs> and you're still in it? I know. <laughs> I mean, I had just returned from Canada. I did a trip to India. I was going to go back to Canada again. I was just like, you know, I had come out of a very long relationship. I'm just like, I'm going to just travel the world. And boom, you can't. <laughs> I was going to make a little film. I was planning like other projects. Nope, you can't. March 13 happened. I was actually taking a mental health day off from work. <laughs> and it wasn't like anything of it, 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 it was so surreal that quarantine art project came out of, I would say, an artist's ego, you know, that I have to create. What do you mean I can't create? I was going to create. I was, you know, I'm I was just at this point of next, what's next for me? And I had moved into this new apartment. Like I said, traveling and all of that. So part one was just an odd feeling of ego and the feeling of not surrendering to what has happened. Uh also like uh, there was a sense of comedy in the toilet paper not being there. And I landed with a can of white beans in my hand. I even spoke to you about it. I've never ate white beans in my life. I'm like, maybe I should take it. Maybe there will be nothing to eat. <laughs> so all of these things, you know, every single day I was like going back home and I was thinking about it. And so I created Quarantine Art Project One because I was capturing these images on my phone of like, make this distance, don't stand far away. I actually went to Whole Foods and a lady said to me, you're coming too close to me, go back, go back. And I was just like, whoa. So there was a lot of, uh, lot of comedy. There was a lot of uh, not really realizing the seriousness of the situation. So Quarantine Part One just came out of this need to continue to create but maybe I also wanted to inspire. And then my brother went through the situation where he was separated from his wife right between the lockdown. His wife was in a different state. He was in the farm alone. And so he said to me, I said to him like, why don't you just capture this moment and send it to me? You know, I'll, I'll make a story out of it. So he was like, so lazy. He's like, well, it's just a farm. You've lived here, you've seen it before. I said, no, just give it to me. You know, give me the what's happening there. And I asked my sister-in-law to do the exact same thing. And I said, why don't you capture your situation? So it kind of started like a chain reaction. And then I started asking other people in Spain. Then I asked uh, this really amazing dance performer, Micah, who actually act was in one of my music videos. Um, I said, do you have something you wanted? So I just started asking people if they had like these clips they wanted to share. And Micah actually gave me this amazing clip of from going from point one door to another door and this place to that place. That was the situation for everyone during the lockdown, you know? Um, so it kind of created a situation where I was in possession of all of the clips. And then my great, talented, amazing French music producer friend, Clelia Felix, who I have created so many music videos for and I, I love her music video music because it inspires me. She creates lots of electronic and uh, lounge and chill out music and writes folk songs. And she 
has given me all of these clips to her songs. And I found a track. I just went into this database that of songs that she has given me. And there was a song called Stuck in a Dream, which beat, lyrics, everything spoke to me. And I was like, can I use it? And she said to me from France, is like, everybody should stay home. You can make a music video, but you, she said that in very cute French manner, you know, that you cannot go out and shoot a music video. I was like, no, no, I'm not doing any of that sort. I'm just, my clips were basically just walk to the store. Whereas I had all of these clips from different parts of the world. And then I created um, this music video and hence part one was created. And it actually, and my friend Heather Cross, she has given, she's a very, very talented photographer and film, uh, 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 just a content creator. And uh, she had this amazing clip of birds which I thought was would go, go in really well in there. Um, and Betsy, Betsy Murphy, who has done shows, and I have recorded her so many times at the Marsh. She was doing Sunday car wash church videos on Instagram stories, basically soap falling on her car, colorful lights. I was like, can I have these? She gave them to me, these clips. And they became such an important aspect of quarantine art project. So I was just gathering things out of ego and out of like this desire to create for part one. And um, hence part one was created with Clelia Felix music, Betsy soapy car washy clips, and some of my brother and my sister-in-law's clips and other folks like Heather Cross and, uh, you will see other clips in there. And it was created out of a lot of naivety and a lot of um, things that I didn't fully understand. Um, so yeah, Quarantine Art Project is something I have kind of um, evolved over this one year. And part one, when I look at it, I feel like, wow, wow. How naive was I? <laughs> Let's see it. We can talk about what you think is naive once we see it. Awesome. Let's do it.
stuck here in a dream <laughs> so beautiful such great music i know the music is amazing so tell me so if you would define the genre of this is it music video is it art video is it all those things how would you define it i think it's a musical film that's what i would call it because um the way it's edited and the way it goes from one scene to another and one situation to another it is uh it is a musical film that's what i would call it what is it, what do you mean by that how do you define a musical film well like your chicago that uh, you know <laughs> it's, it's not a catherine zeta zone type but it's a bit more dark than that and um it's it's again that's what i'm saying like i was going to start making a film make more music videos so it's kind of like a mix of all of those things that i was going to do but the stories are here told by people who have sent me clips and music and i am just the conduit a catalyst and i didn't know when i was doing this because mica's dance performance in this from dancing from one room to her stair is something that threaded everything for me. Um, Betsy's car wash soapy moment, moments made it so much more meaningful for me because we were all going through that moment of like, I have to wash my hands, I have to wash my hands, I have to wash my hands, you know? And um, same thing, you've seen the clips of India. So I could just feel the humidity and the moment that my brother and my, my sister-in-law is not even, you know, she's creative, but she, I wanted her to have a voice as a woman. And she was in a state in Haryana that is known for its backwardness of women. And I was just amazed that she captured like a little clip and she panned the camera so well. I was very proud of her. So stories were told by people in the way they wanted to tell it. And I was just kind of threading them together and pieces kept coming to me. And um, that's what for me, the musical storytelling is because if I were to do a music video per se, it would have a lot of elements of, you know, fantasy in it. It wouldn't have such a straightforward um imagery uh there there could be elements of dreaminess there could be elements of you know lights and cinematography so uh real life documentary storytelling all of those aspects could be applicable to it and um and the music phenomenal clelia felix is just amazing i highly recommend go to clelia felix dot blogspot dot com and support her music everyone <laughs> How do you spell her name or can we put it in the, uh, I don't it's, know if Brian has it or not, to put it in the uh, chat. Oh yeah, C-L-E-L-I-A and last name is Felix, F-E-L-I-X. And basically her first name, last name together, dot blogspot.com. She's, she's one of those amazing people that you can find her photo online. She has kept herself pretty, pretty much focused on her, art <laughs> um so basically in, in a way it's a visual narrative um yeah kind of, kind of um rhythmed or whatever by the music right mm -hmm. you know, like you're encased by the music yeah yeah absolutely and, and what about who was in who was in the trees who was in the trees it's micah <laughs> I thought it might be Micah in the trees, but it was hard to know for sure. Yeah, Micah is, uh, I have, I found her towards my last day at the marsh properly. We spoke properly on my last, last day at the marsh, which I don't really want to call it what was my last day at the marsh. I was just going from one position at the marsh, which I, you always called it that, you know, I'm just going to be part of Marsh in a different kind of way. And I always believe, I, I hope I do, because I find it to be such a great home and place for me. Um, I find her to be a very, very 
musical and dance but uh, oriented person but she tells stories in that way and i have i call myself a visual writer but when i c- combine my skills with people like mica it's it's a lot of work is done already all we have to do is just create something it's just coming to you and creating videos white couch and working at the marsh some of it is some of the work is already done you know like sometimes we work so hard to create art to find the stories to find the right kind of people but with mica even with betsy's um, car wash videos half of the work was done for me you know because mm-hmm. inside the car wash there were lights and everything so cinematography was already done for me so yeah i i am very grateful for all of these people that i work with and and for them to share their 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 talents during this extraordinarily ordinarily strange times that we live in yeah so just so if who, people who don't know so mica fulch has been a marshu theater teacher yeah. for the past over a decade with yeah. us and she teaches our trapeze class and she's a brilliant oh. teacher and we have a whole trapeze set up upstairs because of her where those kids are swinging from the rafters <laughs> truthfully on safe trapezes in fact one time we even did a trapeze she even did a trapeze class for toddlers okay so let's let's go now to quarantine art project part two art two i call it uh, comes with the huge annoying i took it took six months to even finish it um so much happened black lives matter happened our skies turned orange uh fires were happening farmers protests broke down the world was not just dealing with the quarantine it was upside down and i moved to a new apartment that had a beautiful deck where i could have hummingbirds and sunrises sunsets and it changed my narrative and i took a huge massive pause before finishing this one and this one also i wanted to create it with a knowing that this is not the end and we will come out of this with a huge and massive understanding of how we will all connect with each other again the the need for human connection but more peace and more integrity because that's what i felt was happening and um i i enjoyed the pause i actually took it in stride unlike part 1 where i was just like no 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 <laughs> and uh the music for this one is by legendary most amazing mr daniel masam he has been creating he's a self-taught musician another french music producer and he came out with a new album called magic carpet and the track is called elsewhere i was blown away by it he creates ethnic deep chill house sounds and he popularized this genre with buda bar collectives if people know it please google it if you don't i'm sure you know it in 1990s and 2000s and please go support danielmasson.net he i have so much respect for him and he just gave me the track take it and um maggie's black lives matter video is in it there are pe- people like jeremy julian greco he has been doing an amazing photo series 365 days of this quarantine ever i i recommend go and check it out i asked him to give a clip there are um again betsy's pieces are in there there is also um I'm definitely forgetting someone. Clyde always <laughs> Clyde always gave me his typewriter bit and uh I was going to do a film with him but you know we did what we could in this time and there's Dina Gonzalez amazing latin performer who actually got covid and just gave me footage of her lying in the bed during covid. So this one has so much knowing and so much sense of realization and um uh, and my friend Caitlin O'Malier her partner Wally did some great drone shots that I could combine with mine so thank you to all i i 
I hope you enjoy this one. So, artist, Sarika. Love thank you. It. So beautiful. And I have to admit, I wasn't getting what part was in the car wash in part one, but I finally got it in part two. Mm -hmm. And how great to see Clyde. 
I know. <laughs> Clyde is um, so wonderful. I, um, I, I hope to create a film with him at some point, but Oh, he is, he reminds me of Buster Keaton. I did say that to him, <laughs> like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank um, you. We've got some comments. You are such a generous collaborator, so much of your work in partnership. And that's from Kristen. Oh, Kristen. I miss Kristen. And Kelly says, wow, that is a total musical film. Love that this is in collaboration and way to continue to create, elevating your, oops, it's moving while I'm reading it. There's so many, your district, your distinct, I'm sorry, vision. And Gina says, ooh, wow. <laughs> The weaving and layering of the images and editing with the music is phenomenal. So uh, people are like, oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So great to see so many Marsh people in it. But, um, you know, we have to leave in a couple of minutes. But before what? We, yeah, 827 <laughs> time goes so fast when we're having we have so much to talk about. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back. <laughs> I want to talk about you being a hummingbird whisperer. Yay. <laughs> Did you see my hummingbird in the part two? <laughs> I think we have a photo of somebody, a hummingbird. A uh, hummingbird. Hummingbirds have been showing up. And I know Gina, she's here. She knows that uh, I've been. And that uh, the one on the corner is actually a black eyed Junko. They have started showing up too. So I live, breathe, and talk bird now. <laughs> That's what has happened to me in quarantine. <laughs> and um, I'm very grateful for this new place that I'm at because it has given me this chance to connect with nature in a way I have never connected. And look at this hummingbird. He, this gentleman, gentle lady, or they just sits there waits for me to take a picture and juncos they come in they eat the sunflower seed talk about the brands leave <laughs> so as you know you, as you whisper to them yes i do and i raised a, i i i mean it, that was a joke i was cracking with you that i've raised a hummingbird family during the winter time because i started i did not know what hummingbird ate I had no idea. I just thought they were so magnificent and I would put flowers around them. So then I found a YouTube video. Then I was like, oh, it's a nectar. They want nectar. So I put nectar around and I totally entrapped them. And then apparently what happens is that if during mating time, a hummingbird would uh, have its babies pretty close to food. So this one hummingbird decided to just live by my deck, not pay rent or anything. I was like, that's okay. I'm okay with that. I am i don't have any visitors. Nobody's coming in and out. So I'm a collaborator. <laughs> so yeah, and anytime I would try and change the feeder, a couple of times this one would come and check me out. Like, what are you doing? What, why are you touching it? Then I would actually have a talk with that one saying, I am the one that is providing this for you. I'm allowed to clean this. <laughs> so we had like an understanding. I was like, you give me photos, I give you food. <laughs> so I'm gonna put these in. Um, my friend Gina has actually given me this place called Audubon and they are doing a bird competition. So I'm gonna submit all of these there. I would have never thought of that if, if I didn't have these hummingbirds and juncos coming over. I mean, you've got apples to talk about. <laughs> yes, I'll talk about my apple series. <laughs> I love it. These are my apples. Look at them. There's the rainbow apple, the apple with the mule, and the sun apple. And I have a whole book of apple photos. You just never know what's going to happen when you're in a weird situation. <laughs> quarantine art that you are doing is so fabulous. And I'm so happy to be talking to you, Sarika. I don't get to talk to you every day like I used to, but I know to have you on and to see what you're doing. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And we're out of time. 
Well, I want to bring in your Apple and Mule images in one of my future projects at some point. Okay. That's what, that's what I want to say. And um, very grateful to be here on Marsh Stream, a place that I call my creative home. And um, I would not think of any other place to showcase my work than here and um, not just a person who worked there, I'm a forever supporter of Marsh. And I highly ask everyone to, you know, tip and support the Marsh, um, support um, all the programs that they are running, please, please, please. Because, you know, I believe that art gives us a way to speak up for causes that matters. And right now during this pandemic, this language is hurting. So let's support it. Please, let's do it. Thank you, Sarika. Thank you so much.